Ladies and gentlemen, isn't that wonderful to hear from Slavi? And I hope we will have him back again to talk to us in the future. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the high point of the day. We have sometimes been called a one-man band, have we not? And could there be a better demonstration than today that that isn't the case? However, our one man is pretty special, ladies and gentlemen, is he not? Please let's hear it for Nigel Farage. Good morning, everybody. I think the first and perhaps most important thing that I've got to do today is to say a really massive congratulations to Diane James, the team, and the hundreds of people that came and helped us with that spectacular result that we secured at Eastleigh. So I want to hear it from you. Let's hear the Eastleigh roar. But of course, Eastleigh wasn't a one-off, because since our last spring conference, we had a by-election in Corby, where Margot James did brilliantly in getting nearly 15% and our best ever at that time score in a by-election. And we fought a by-election in Middlesbrough, where Richard Elvin, from an absolutely standing start, managed to come second in that by-election. And of course, let's not forget Rotherham, where Jane Collins scored 22% of the vote and also came second in that by-election. And the question that the commentators are asking, the question that increasingly everybody in this country is asking, is what's going on? Why is UKIP surging? Well, I'll tell you, there is a wholesale rejection of the career political professional class in this country going on. We have had enough of them. And they really do all look the same and sound the same. They all go to the same schools, the same Oxbridge colleges. None of them have ever had a job in the real world, and not one of them is in politics for principle. And that's what we stand for, principle. And there are, there are millions of ordinary, decent people out there who feel betrayed by this political class, a class who appear to be more interested in their own careers and in what other foreign leaders think than what is in the national interest for the people of this country. And those people are turning to UKIP. And please don't just think that it's just tired conservatives that are coming to UKIP. We're drawing our support from across the spectrum. And the really interesting thing, and I think the real potential that UKIP's got was shown by the fact that at Eastleigh, a third of our votes came from conservatives, but the rest of our vote came from the Liberal Democrats, it came from old Labour, and interestingly, a significant number of the votes that we got at Eastleigh came from people who hadn't voted for anybody for the last 20 years. And we should be proud, as a party, that we're re-engaging those people. Well, of course, it's now been said that it's just a protest vote. Just a protest vote, nothing to worry about, just a few midterm blues for the coalition. Well, I'll tell you, it's something far more powerful than a protest vote. People are turning out and voting for UKIP. Yes, some of them, perhaps some of them do want to stick two fingers up to the establishment, which is pretty understandable, isn't it? <laughs> but actually, the vast majority of people who are going out and voting UKIP in those by-elections are doing so because we are the party that are putting forward positive, alternative policies that would make this country a better and prouder place.
and we're not hamstrung by political correctness. We're not afraid to take on the issues that everybody else would like to simply brush under the carpet. I heard Nick Clegg yesterday saying that he welcomed the debate on immigration. <laughs> uh, the truth is that on immigration, those three parties, the Lib, Lab, Con, are all the same because they all support a total open door to the whole of Eastern Europe. They all support that door being flung even wider open to the 29 million people from Bulgaria and Romania. And as you heard from our previous speaker, Slavi Binev, things are in a pretty unhappy situation in those countries. But worse than that, they even all support Turkey joining the European Union with unlimited access for those 80 million people. And our message is simple. We are not against anybody. We wish people from all of those former communist countries the very best. But it cannot make sense for us to open our doors to massive oversupply in the unskilled labor market in this country at a time when we have a million young people out of work. That doesn't make sense. And it is an outrage, as far as I'm concerned, that from the 1st of January next year, people in unlimited numbers from Bulgaria and Romania can come to this country and within a very short space of time, claim job seekers allowance, housing benefit, child benefit. I'm sorry, but the benefit system in this country should be there to be used by nationals of this country who in many places come from generations of families who have paid tax and national insurance into the central pot. And, and as far as UKIP are concerned, nobody should be able to access the health service and the benefit system in this country until they have been in this country for five years, paid their taxes and obeyed the law. That would be right, that would be fair. If UKIP had not taken on this immigration debate, the others would not be talking about it at all. And it is not racist to talk about immigration. And I believe that by taking on this issue, this will be, I think, the major battleground on EU membership between now and whenever a referendum will come, because it is a basic facet of a state that you should be able to control your borders and decide in your own parliament who comes to live work and settle in our country and we will fight this battle. But of course it isn't just uh, immigration that we're campaigning on. Uh, what about household bills? That's absolutely at the top of people's worry in this country and uh, whenever you get the electricity bill through it's a bit of a shock isn't it? And yet once again we see that our career political class are indeed all the same because they all support the carbon targets agreed in Brussels. They are all enthusiasts for building what I think are ugly, useless, wasteful, expensive wind turbines that are now despoiling. <laughs> despoiling Britain's landscapes and seascapes and for some years now, we've said as a party that unless we get real on this really important question of energy, that at some point in the future, we face blackouts. Now, you'd have seen in the newspapers yesterday that we may well now run out of gas within the next couple of weeks. So this isn't a problem that could occur in five years' time. It's a problem that could be on us by the time the spring is over. And what we are saying as a party is we have got to stop the billions of pounds of taxpayers' money that are being poured in to an utterly futile, useless wind energy program. It must come to a halt and come to a halt right now. <laughs> and frankly, we need to have a referendum on the European Union, not in five years' time, but actually this year because we need to stop the closure 
of those six coal-fired power stations, which will be closed down next year, which we're going to need to keep the lights on in this country. And you know, if you look just in the last couple of years, you see that both the aluminium smelters in this country have closed down. You see that steelworks in the north of England have closed down and relocated to India. So even if we were worried about CO2 emissions, it doesn't make much difference, does it, if all we're doing is paying to close down British manufacturing and send it across to India. It's madness. Oh, and I nearly forgot, there's another issue on which they're all the same, and that, of course, is membership of the European Union. <laughs> all three parties support our continued membership on the Union, and we, of course, have campaigned long and hard and made the argument that we are not anti-European in any way at all. We wish to live and work and trade with our neighbours. We want to be friends with Europe, but we do not wish to be governed by the European institutions by people the likes of Herman Van Rompuy. <laughs> I was rather disappointed in the week when I heard that he's retiring next year. I shall miss him terribly. <laughs> but we've made the argument for years, and now it's a mainstream argument, that we want an amicable divorce from the political European Union and its replacement with a genuine free trade agreement, which is what we thought we'd signed up for in the first place. And I must say that the appalling events in Cyprus over the course of the last week have surpassed even my direst of predictions given in some of those helpful contributions that I've made in the European Parliament <laughs> over the last few years. Even I didn't think that they would stoop to actually stealing money from people's bank accounts. I find that totally astonishing. Um, I wish really in the wake of that uh, that George Osborne would say that under no circumstances would we ever do that to banks in this country because there is going to be a big flight of money. And that flight of money won't just be from Cyprus, it will be from the other Eurozone countries too. And remember, there are three quarters of a million British people who own properties or who live, many in retirement, down in Spain. And I think our message to them has got to be, now that the EU has crossed this line, now that we see they're prepared to resume